Hi, David Pecker here, and in this video I would like to discuss spy satellites, their history, their uses, and how they found civilian applications. Now when we discuss spy satellites, what do we usually think about? Well, for me, I usually think about the volcano layer of a James Bond villain, as depicted here. But does this have anything to do with actual spy satellites? Well, let's start in the beginning. Following World War II, the world was split into two parts. Uh, the western part and the eastern part. These two parts were led by different ideologies. Democracy in the west and communism in the east. Both wanted to know what the other one was uh, up to and therefore they developed various spy technologies. In the west, one of these spy technologies uh, were uh, high altitude reconnaissance airplanes, like this U-2 depicted here. This U-2 airplane was designed to fly extremely high, where the western powers thought it was invulnerable to the Soviet missiles. The images gathered by this airplane would tell the western world what kind and how many weapons does the eastern world have. The U-2 was built by Lockheed and it was designed by their head engineer Kelly Johnson. In this picture Kelly Johnson is depicted next to Gary Powers, one of the U-2 pilots. Gary Powers worked for the Central Intelligence Agency and on May 1st of 1960 he took off from uh, Pakistan in a U-2 airplane to overfly the Soviet Union and take photographs. On his flight deep into Soviet territory, he was shot down over Sverdlovsk. Powers was able to safely parachute away from his aircraft and was captured by the Soviets, put on trial, but eventually returned back to United States. However, this incident put a stop to CIA overflights of the Soviet Union and allied countries, as it became clear that the Soviets have developed missile technologies which were good enough to shoot down the spy airplanes. And this is where the spy satellites came in, starting uh, with KH-1 Corona back in 1959 uh, and 1960. The early spy satellites had film cameras in them, which took pictures from space, and then the camera film would be returned back to Earth and processed to develop the images. In the early days of spaceflight, it wasn't clear if the two competing ideologies, the Eastern and Western ideologies, would shoot down each other's satellites in space. However, since satellites pretty much have to overfly both Eastern and Western countries, it was soon decided to just let the satellites be and not try to shoot them down. This decision let both the Soviet Union and United States safely spy on each other from space. The development of film cameras culminated, at least in the West, with the KH-9 hexagon satellite. This was an absolutely huge satellite, which had a 60-inch primary mirror, which is one and a half meters in size in metric units, and it had multiple uh, return capsules to bring film down from orbit. From the uh, United States, the most advanced spy satellites that we know about are the KH-11s. And if these look familiar to you, there is a reason. These uh, look very similar to the Hubble Space Telescope. And it is because the Hubble Space Telescope used the technology which was first developed to build these spy satellites. The KH-11s were first designed back in the 70s, and certainly there are more advanced spy satellites now, but they are classified, so we don't really know what they do. But let's talk more broadly. What else do spy satellites do besides gather uh, optical images? There are also spy satellites that do radar imaging, and this is important because radar imaging satellites can work in all weather conditions, but of course they have lower resolution than optical imaging satellites. They can be used to detect airplanes, ships, and that type of thing. Uh, 
So we've also found important civilian applications in fields like geology and meteorology, where they're used to map mountains, as well as ocean levels, and also to measure wind speeds. There are also spy satellites that do signal intelligence, which means they intercept communications of other countries. Additionally, there are spy satellites used for secure communications. And finally, there are of course things which are classified and which we don't know about. However, a lot of the spy satellite technology is now in wide use in the civilian world. One of the products that you might be quite familiar with is a satellite view on Google Maps. For example, this image of our campus shows the hall at the top where we are supposed to be having our class. Now, where does this image come from? Well, looking at the bottom, it says that it comes from Maxer Technologies. And what is exactly Maxer Technologies? Well, it is a satellite imaging company. It runs a bunch of civilian imaging satellites, like this Worldview 3 satellite. The picture at the top shows the wavelengths of light that this Worldview 3 satellite can image, including a bunch of uh, visible light bands, two near-infrared bands, and several uh, labeled as WIR, which are really far infrared bands. Now, what sort of images do satellites like this produce? Well, here is a raw image from Worldview 4 satellite, which basically has the same imaging technologies as the Worldview 3 satellites on the previous slide. And here, zooming in on a parking lot, we can clearly see uh, different cars and the car parking spaces. However, the resolution is not quite good enough to be able to do things like read the car license plates. So what is the smallest feature that can be resolved by these Worldview 3 and 4 satellites? Well, let's think about it. The orbital altitude, that is how high the satellite is above the surface of the Earth, is 617 kilometers. The shortest wavelength sensor on these satellites uh, works at 450 nanometers, and the size of the primary mirror in the telescope is 1.1 meters. Therefore, the angular resolution, using the angular resolution formula, theta equals 1.2 lambda over d, and I have added the factor of 1.22 in order to get the same answer as the one which is published. So, plugging in the numbers, lambda is 450 nanometers, and d, the telescope diameter, is 1.1 meters, which gives us an angular resolution of 5 times 10 to negative 7 radians. Now, how do we convert the angular resolution to the smallest resolvable feature? Well, we need to multiply theta by the distance between the telescope and the object that it's looking at. And this distance is the orbital altitude of the satellite, 617 kilometers. Multiplying 5 times 10 to negative 7 radians by 617 kilometers gets us the, uh, that the smallest resolvable feature is 30 centimeters, which is exactly the number which is published for the two satellites. Now let's quickly compare the commercial uh, Earth imaging satellites to the ones which are run by the spy, uh, spy agencies, like uh, the National Reconnaissance Office in the United States. The uh, obvious comparison is to the latest satellite that we know about, which is a KH-11. That one has a telescope aperture of 2.5 meters, which is exactly the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope. Plugging 2.5 meters for D, gets us the smallest resolvable feature of 13.5 centimeters. Newer spy satellites probably have even better resolution and almost certainly use adaptive optics to compensate for atmospheric distortion. At this point, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about adaptive optics because that's quite a cool technology. What is adaptive optics? Well, you know when you look at the night sky, you see the stars twinkle. Now, twinkling stars are not particularly good for astronomers because it's much harder to take an image of a twinkling star. You can think of atmospheric distortions as kind of lenses in the atmosphere formed by air currents. Now, in order to improve imaging, 
one would, rem would like to remove the effect of these distortions. And the way to do this is with adaptive optics. Adaptive optics systems work by inserting a deformable mirror into the telescope, like the one schematically shown here, which is made by Alp AO. The idea being that the deformable mirror is uh, deformed in a response to atmospheric distortions to cancel them out and thus make the stars untwinkle. For an example of how well this works, let's take a look at this image from Apache Point Observatory's 3.5 meter telescope. The image on the left has the adaptive optics off and the one on the right has adaptive, adaptive optics on. And while you can clearly see two distinct stars in the binary system in the image on the right, you can't in the image on the left. While astronomers use adaptive optics to look up through the atmosphere, it is almost certain that the National Reconnaissance Office uses adaptive optics when looking down through the atmosphere. Now what can these civilian uh, Earth observation satellites be used for? Well, here are some examples from the Satellite Imaging Corporation's website. Apparently they can be used for energy and infrastructure, engineering and construction, the military and other defense agencies by their data as well. They can be uh, used for conservation and research. Indeed, there are several archaeological sites that were, uh, that were found using satellite data. They can be uh, used for uh, geotechnology, disaster response, where they can be used to quickly map the disaster area. They could be used to understand natural resources and also to assist farmers. And they can be used for media and entertainment. To conclude the discussion of spy satellites, I want to tell you two stories. The first story concerns the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Back in 2012, the National Reconnaissance Office donated a pair of telescopes uh, to NASA to use for science. Now these telescopes were comparable to Hubble in terms of their resolution, but they had a much wider uh, field of view allowing the astronomers and also the NRO to, match, to map much wider spaces. Now the reason that the NRO donated these telescopes to NASA was because they were outdated technology for the spy agency. However, the optics in these telescopes were excellent and NASA decided to convert them into scientific instruments. There have of course been difficulties in developing these telescopes into usable instruments and one of those difficulties is that uh, the NRO removed all the uh, electronics, which are of course top secret, and NASA is working on developing their own electronics packaging and figuring out how to launch the telescope. Both of these tasks are taking quite a long time due to the shortage of funding. And by the way, the telescope's namesake is Dr. Nancy Grace Roman. She was the lady who set up NASA's astronomy program starting back in 1959. She was a chief of astronomy at NASA in the 60s and 70s, and one of her big projects and accomplishments was uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which at the time was called the Large Space Telescope. She did all the preliminary work, launching smaller telescopes and proving out the telescope technologies in space, and she also convinced the astronomy community, as well as Congress, to go ahead and fund the Hubble Space Telescope. The second story of how intelligence agencies help advance science that I want to tell you concerns the gamma ray bursts. Back in the 60s, it was decided that the United States should have some satellites which could be used to detect covert tests of nuclear weapons. Pictured on the left are the first two in the series, the Vela A and B satellites. How these satellites work is by detecting X-rays, neutrons and gamma rays from uh, nuclear weapons explosions, therefore uncovering these explosions even if there are no conventional signatures like seismic signatures caused by the explosions. In the period from 1967 to 1973, the Vela satellites detected 16 bursts of, bursts of gamma rays that were not anything like what was expected from nuclear weapons tests. Moreover, 
the team confirms that this did not have either a terrestrial origin, that is, coming from the Earth, nor a solar origin, coming from the Sun. And this was quite a big puzzle in astronomy for a very long time. The breakthrough finally happened in 1997, when a specialized satellite called BIPOSAX detected a gamma ray burst and then quickly trained an X-ray camera on it and observed an afterglow. The William Herschel telescope was quickly pointed in the same direction and saw an optical afterglow of the burst before it completely faded. This allowed astronomers to measure how far away the burst occurred and it became clear that these bursts occur in far, far away galaxies. By 1998, there was a solid connection between supernovae and gamma ray bursts. In 2009, burst alert, the Burst Alert Telescope on the SWIFT satellite identified a gamma ray burst that is the furthest known object at a distance of 13 billion light years. One of the most recent developments is observation in 2017 and 18 that uh, mergers of binary neutron stars can be identified as a second source of gamma ray bursts, in addition to the supernovae. I hope you guys found this story of uh, spy satellites interesting and certainly quite different than what happens in James Bond movies. Thanks for watching and remember to stay curious.